it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Operation Apple Tree, Part 3, Endgame, Chapter 16. I looked around. A man in a white coat and a few other people in green scrubs were fussing around my bed. James, can you hear me? The man who I now realized was a doctor asked me. Can you speak? He added. We're... What? I asked, sitting up in a panic. My mouth clearly wasn't on the same page as my brain for the moment. The doctor placed his hands on my shoulders and gently pushed me back into the embrace of the pillow. Hey, 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 you just take it easy. You're in the ICU at the NKC hospital. You've spent the last ten days in a medically induced coma, following a pretty serious assault. Along with over eighty broken bones, you also suffered some pretty severe head trauma. You had a lot of swelling on your brain, but we managed to reduce it with oxygen therapy. Your body seemed to be able to cope without the machine, so we took the decision to revive you, the doctor explained. How do you feel, Mr. Rodriguez? Do you remember anything? He asked. I tried to recall the events he was talking about, but it was hazy at first. I remembered Ruth, that was for sure. I remembered telling her to watch Marshall. I also remember Campbell and him telling me to meet him. And after that, it was all a blur. Ruth? Where's Ruth? I managed to ask. There was still a lot of swelling, and the doctor smiled. Ah, if you mean Miss Maddock, she's outside with your friends. Are you feeling up to a quick visit? He asked. Yeah, please, I mumbled. The nurses were ushered out, and I could see Ruth, Martinez, and Sarah through the window, speaking to the doctor. I can't explain it, but it was like I had adrenaline and trembolone mainlined into my veins when I saw her glance over the doctor's shoulder and smile at me. The doctor warned them not to stress me out, and they had ten minutes max. The three entered my room and stood around my bed. Ruth was happy to see me, but I could tell she was desperately trying not to cry as she looked at me. I grinned at her, despite how much it hurt. Yeah, I know I look like shit. It's fine, I stated humorously. Oh, I thought I lost you, Ruth confessed wholeheartedly, and I smiled at her vulnerability. Well, I'm not going anywhere, Ruth, I promise you, I said, placing my casted hand on hers. She placed hers on top of it and held it tight. What... what happened? I groaned. How... how did you find me? Well, this one pulled it out of the bag, Martinez said with a smile, nodding in Ruth's direction. I turned to look at her teary face, and I thanked her with my eyes. She was too emotional to answer right now. How? I asked him softly. Well, you remember your guys' trip to the Aura nightclub to find the CCTV that Marshall dumped? Martinez probed. I switched an awkward look between him and Ruth, until he scoffed and tapped me gently on my shoulder. Soup, it's fine. A lot's happened while you've been out. We all know about Marshall, he revealed. Where is he now? I asked. He went on the run for a few days, but we caught up with him eventually. Right now, he's sat in Leavenworth, under arrest for malfeasance in office. Conspiracy to kidnap a federal agent... Conspiracy to murder a government official and two counts of conspiracy to murder a federal witness, too, Martinez revealed. Two counts, I gasped. Martinez grimaced and nodded his head. Well, officially, Kim and Sandy Marsh's deaths are still being suspected of being caused by large diamorphin overdoses. We've discovered evidence that suggests he tipped off the OCG that she was no longer under surveillance. Also, the bodies are still at the coroner's office, so... We're arranging for an independent medical examiner to perform a post-mortem, Martinez informed me. I exhaled heavily after the increased blood flow in my body caused an acute rush of pain. Oh, the DNA. Get the DNA, I managed to request. Martinez once again nodded his head enthusiastically. Oh, we will, Soup, we will. And when we do, we'll know who these girls, like Sandy Marsh, are being groomed for. What we don't know is why she was found with Kim. You guys, you'll find out. Just keep digging, I advised him weakly. So, uh, 
was the other count. Malik, Martinez revealed. What? I gasped. Yeah, amongst the evidence that suggested he'd something to do with Kim, well, it's also looking like he was the one who tipped off the OCG about Malik, and also framed SSA Michaels. We've searched his rented accommodation, found a cache of burner phones, texts and calls from unknown numbers going back to the prior weeks, leading up to the start of Operation Apple Tree. I don't know why or how, but the OCG made sure they got an inside man on the task force to tie us in knots. The OJ are processing Michaels to be released, but it's going to be a week at least, while they look into Marshall and get his side of things. Oh, I knew it. Marcus always said that he was innocent and um, I left him in there, I said, angry at myself. So we all feel bad, but we had jobs to do. At the end of the day, we follow the evidence, and the evidence at the time said it was Michael's. Look, he'll understand. The only person to blame here is Marshall, Sarah said comfortingly. Ruth and Martinez all nodded in sympathetic agreement. So, um, right, you were saying uh, about the nightclub? I asked curiously. Ah, uh, well, yeah, the man on the door, Dennis Gordon, whose burner number Ruth acquired. We ran historical triangulation data on the number. We linked it to the second ambush site on the night of Ian Malik's murder. So after you called Ruth and managed to tell us something was wrong, we headed to where the coal was made from. We found your car and phone, along with severe tire marks that suggested a kidnap. Now, given how the OCG used him for the potential murder of a federal witness, There'd be a good reason to believe they'd use him to kidnap a federal agent. So, she called the number, and luckily he answered. So we were able to trace the call to your general whereabouts. The KC field office supplied us with enough armed security to rescue you, Martinez explained proudly, as I stared longingly at the woman I loved. Oh, you're amazing. You know that? I asked her rhetorically. Well, you do the same for me. She replied emotionally. Right, well, me and Sarah are going to leave you two lovebirds to it. Doc says you'll be discharged in a few days. But you'll be in a chair for a long time while your bones set. But, seeing as it was in the line of duty, Uncle Sam's paying for a state-of-the-art electric wheelchair. So you'll be able to get about just fine. When you're out, we can brief you properly on the developments of the last two weeks. Ah, good to see you, Sue. Yeah, yeah, well soon, James, Sarah added. The two began to leave the room, but I called them back. Martinez. Yes, yeah, Soup. So, um, are you heading up the task force now? I asked curiously. This seemed to make him uncomfortable, and he began to babble. Yeah, Quantico said it was best until we're whole again. So, it's only temp until you're back on your feet or Michael's is out, but Soup, but this wasn't my call. I was just following up. It's fine, it's fine. But you're a phenomenal agent. I'm happy you're stepping up, I assured him. He gave me a smile of respect, and then he left with Sarah. Ruth waited until the door closed before placing her hands on my swollen face and kissing my head as if it was the most precious thing in the world. I uh, take it the words out about us then, I chuckled weakly. Yeah, but... Martinez isn't going to say anything. Sarah told me they've been seeing each other as well. We're all in agreement that if it doesn't affect the investigation, then it's no one else's business, she said. You spoke to Sarah? I scoffed. Ruth rolled her eyes and chuckled. Yeah, you're right. She is really nice. She's good at her job, too. When we found you, I didn't think you were going to make it. She's really helped me through this. Well, they both have, to be honest. She confessed. What happened when you found me? Did you catch who, who was there? I inquired. Five of them were holding you in an empty HGV depot in Vineyard Estates. Now, during the raid, three were shot dead. One fled the scene, but we managed to get one in custody, she informed me. Well, a combination of talking about the event and my brain starting to revive, I started to get a hazy memory of the event. The laptop. There was a laptop. I spoke to Mr. X, I informed Ruth desperately. She had a regretful expression on her face as she nodded. Yeah, we found the laptop. 
But one of the men holding you took a hammer to the device and the dongle before we could get to him. He was the one who fled the scene while the others opened fire on us. Is anyone hurt? I asked with concern. Ruth shook her head proudly. No, all the casualties were OCG. I smiled and relaxed my shoulders into the pillow. So, um, who's in custody? I asked. Our friend from the nightclub, Dennis Gordon, surrendered himself after his buddies dropped during the firefights. Well, for his size, he didn't put up much of a fight. Didn't even try to flee, either. Almost like he wanted to be caught, Ruth pointed out with a chuckle. Ah, don't judge a book by its cover. They're drawn in by the money and the rep. But they soon feel trapped, and they want out. Now, has he uh, said anything? I inquired. Ruth had a troubled look on her face, as if weighing up whether she should tell me what she was about to. Ruth, I pressed. He's agreed to talk, but on one condition. What? He'll only speak to you, and you only. Six days passed. Ruth, Sarah, and Martinez continued to visit and check up on me. A lot of the severe pain had passed now. Well, the morphine certainly helped. However, the doctors and surgeons had set and plated all my broken bones. And luckily, the fractures weren't as bad as I'd feared, and the surgeon informed me that there should be little lasting nerve damage. Nothing too serious. But any chances of being a pianist were likely over. The main surgery was on my hands and knees. My legs and ankles were pinned and my knees were plated. People were teasing me and calling me names like the Supinator and Wolverine. But when my chair had arrived a couple of days ago, those soon turned to be Ironside and Professor X. As well as physio, I practiced using the chair around the hospital. And fair play to the bureau, it handled like a dream. When I could walk again, I was going to miss this little bad boy. It was 2pm, I was due a visit from Ruth and the others. I'd agreed to speak to Dennis Gordon, and she was coming to fill me in on recent developments in the investigation prior to this meeting. Every time I saw that beautiful red hair walking through the door, it was like I'd had a fresh shot of morphine. Hey, how are you feeling? She asked gleefully. Better, I assured her. Look, where are Sarah and Martinez? I asked curiously. Well, Ruth bit her bottom lip awkwardly. Um, they have other assignments, she half explained. I could tell there was something troubling her, though. What is it, Ruth? What's happened? I probed. Marshall, he's dead. What? I exclaimed, eyes wide. Yeah, four days ago. Guards found him in the gym, hung from the pull-up bar, Ruth informed me, shaking her head. Was he murdered? I asked. We're still waiting for the post-mortem, but right now, it's looking like he knew the game was up and didn't want to spend the rest of his life inside. He was VP, so there were only guards in the vicinity at the time. No other prisoners, Ruth speculated. Hmm, how does that affect Michael's release? I quizzed. Well, the DOJ would have preferred a statement from Michael's, confessing to the setup. I would have sped up the process, but the evidence they found is likely enough to clear his name. Well, that's at least something. So, what did they find in Marshall's apartment, I mean? Ruth pulled a file out of her handbag and laid it across my thighs. She opened the file and flicked to a background report on Marshall. His background file says he has a sister who lives in Topeka. That's part of the reason he was recruited for Operation Apple Tree. Despite his expertise with investigating organized crime, he was familiar with the area. We believe he was a link for the KCOCG and helped them secure other relationship with OCGs near the Mexican border. Likely drugs from a cartel. Which brings us around to what we found in his apartment, she explained, flicking the page, showing me a photo of five unregistered cell phones. Now, these were found in a jiffy bag under his mattress. The oldest of the five phones has texts from various unknown numbers, going back to the weeks leading up to Apple Tree. The texts inform him to put himself forward for the op, and they'll make sure he's given a seat. His supplies show he was someone willingly working for these people. Uh, this wasn't someone being blackmailed. This was someone who was up to his neck with these people. 
He received a text around eight hours before the ambush that read, Lawrence compromised. Contact M, make arrangements. X. Marshall then replies to the same number. Too hot. People will want a scapegoat. To which the number simply replies, Then find one, you'll think of something. The number then goes out of service. There was a text to another number that we've analysed and based on its movement we think it's Nathan. This text was sent three nights before they found Kim and Sandy Marsh. It read, Eyes on, too hot. And then a text on the night at 6.08pm that read, Surveillance off, free to clean up. There was also a text the day before we went to visit Michaels in Leavenworth that read, The scapegoat needs reminder to keep his mouth shut. Contact assets in LW. X. But the killer text read, TC talking. Maybe it's time to cut ties. And this was sent the day you revealed to the team that you had him on board as an asset. The reply came shortly after, which read, Not yet. The timing needs to be right. We could kill two birds with one stone. X. Then on the day of your kidnapping, around an hour before Thomas Campbell contacted you to meet, one of Marshall's burners contacted Campbell's burner phone that we gave him, likely to instruct him on what to do. The texts were coming directly from the top man. They were all signed X, as in Mr. X, instructing Marshall to continuously railroad the investigation. This has all been sent to the DOJ, and they said they should have Michaels out within the week. Bureau have already confirmed he can return to the task force, and given how you're out of action, he'll head up the task force for the remaining two weeks. I spoke to him the other day, and whew, he's out for blood. Yeah, I bet. They framed him, had him locked up with the people he spent years putting away, beat him to within an inch of his life. Oh, he won't rest until he's caught them. He's dogged on a normal day. Let's just hope the OCG don't get to him first before he's released, I said, concerned. Oh, he's on 24-hour lockdown. His door only opens for his meals. He'll be fine, Ruth assured me, and I smiled. Finally, some good news. So, um... When did Marshall run? I quizzed. When it came out that you'd been abducted, I confronted him, telling him we knew he was corrupt. Well, he denied it, of course, but when I cornered him with the fact we knew that he'd got rid of the nightclub CCTV, he panicked, pulled his gun on us, and fled HQ. He was later found trying to leave the state and subsequently arrested. He refused to talk until his lawyer was present. Now, this lawyer, Roger Barnard, based at a firm in San Bernardino, was in court and couldn't get to Leavenworth for a few days. Marshall died before he could get there and represent him. Mm, good lawyers cut deals. Maybe word reached Mr. X and he ordered him to be silenced before that could happen. If he was in as deep as you say, he would have had valuable information on the OCG. I speculated. Well, whatever the case, we finally got the rat. We saved you, and we're getting Michaels back. Now we can get on with catching these bastards, Ruth said passionately. However, she noticed the vacant look on my face. James, something wrong? She asked with concerned curiosity. Did we, though? <laughs> get the rat. Burn is found under the mattress, just like Michael's phone with all the GPS saved for us to find. Seems convenient, doesn't it? Now he's dead and can't say any different, I pointed out. Ruth shook her head. Innocent men don't delete evidence. They don't pull guns on federal agents. They don't try and flee the state. Oh, and Michaels defended himself and protested his innocence and he's still alive. Yeah, but he wasn't exactly unscathed, was he? James, you're just feeling guilty that you didn't believe Michaels and you put him in prison for something he didn't do. As now you're second-guessing Marshall. Trust me, James. I was there. He did it, she assured me. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right, I conceded, and Ruth smirked. I usually am, she quipped. Yeah, don't push it, I joked back. So why does this Dennis Gordon want to speak to me? I asked curiously. I was hoping you might know, to be honest, she confessed. And I looked at her with a confused expression. What do you mean? He wouldn't speak to Martinez or Sarah, or anyone else for that matter. But he told one of the guards, he'd tell the girl with the red hair that I'll only speak to Agent Rodriguez because, and I quote, 
I was the reason he was tortured so badly. Have any clue what that means? Because, well, he's just muscle. Can't imagine he's a shock collar in any way. Ruth's question caused me to think back to my ordeal. The memories were extremely hazy when I first woke up. It was like my brain had stopped recording whilst I'd been attacked. But as the days went on, it was like it was slowly coming back. I could even remember the event now, but if I tried extremely hard, I could start to remember more intimate details. Oh, well, um, when they were holding me, well, they were asking me questions, I explained. What sort of questions? Well, the sort that the wrong answers get your knees capped. I scoffed with dark humor. Ruth winced. Can you remember what they asked you? She probed. I closed my eyes and concentrated. Yeah, something about the country club. What we knew about it, I muttered as I tried desperately hard to remember. Well, there's no evidence linking Gordon to the con oh, Wait, wait. I do remember something else, I exclaimed. And Ruth's brow raised as she leant forward in anticipation. They said, Who's the rat? Or, Who's your rat? Oh, oh damn, it's gone. I pinched my nose in frustration. The rat? Ruth repeated with a puzzled expression. Yeah, had no idea what they were talking about. As far as I can remember, that's all they asked. Oh, and he said, don't let them know you're a fed. Just tell them you're his lawyer. What? I asked with an incredulous chuckle. Why? I have no idea. And Ruth shrugged. I pouted and nodded my head. Well then, I guess we all just have to ask him. Chapter 17 The next day Ruth drove us up to Leavenworth. I did my best to hide how much her helping me out of the car and into my chair hurt my pride. Two weeks ago we'd been a couple, going out having fun, making love and generally being a team. Now it was hard not to see her as my carer, and I was her burden. We made our way into the visitor's entrance, and I rolled up to the front desk. James Rodriguez and my paralegal, Ruth Maddock, to speak to our client, Dennis Gordon. I informed the woman on duty. Her moody face didn't spit a word. She simply flicked her brow and rolled her chair over to the radio. She arranged the prisoner to be collected from his cell and brought to the interview room, after around 30 minutes, we were still sat in the waiting room, though. Then the door buzzed, and a guard called us through. Thankfully, the guard who led us to the interview rooms was a different one to when we'd visited Michael's. Not that they'd recognize me now, anyway. Shaved hair from all the stitches, wheelchair-bound, swelling still around my jaw. Oh, not sure my own mother would recognize me, to be honest. God rest her soul. We were led into a private booth where we waited for Gordon. This one was different to when we'd interviewed Michaels, though. It had no glass screen separating us. It was a private room, with a desk, two chairs either side of it, and a camera in the top left corner of the room. The red LED light showed it was recording. I tapped Ruth on the shoulder and pointed up at the camera. She followed my finger in line of vision. Ah, that's why he wanted us down at his legal team, I stated confidently. She looked puzzled for a moment before finally the penny dropped. Ah, Ruth said, impressed at Gordon's plan. Yep, makes this meeting privileged. Therefore, no one can watch or listen. A few moments later, the second door of the room buzzed and the lock snapped. The guard led the hulking human who was Dennis Gordon into the room, undid his chains and shackled and closed the door behind him. He made his way over to us, not saying a word. He pulled out a seat and sat down. We all sat there silently, whilst I flicked my eyes up at the camera every so often. Eventually the red light went out, and I turned to face Dennis Gordon. Very clever, asking us to pose as your legal counsel, to make sure no one can listen in on this conversation. Not exactly the thinking of someone who's all brain, no brain, just hired muscle. Who are you, Dennis? I questioned, and he chuckled. How you feeling? He asked, a mixture of sarcasm and concern. Ah, tickety-boo, I answered facetiously. Why do you remember? 
he asked curiously. I remember having nine shades of shit smashed out of me, all the while being asked, who's the rat? I'm guessing that's you, I ventured. Ah, you be correct, super spag, Gordon confirmed. The use of the word super spag caused my eyes to widen. The phrase was an FBI in-house nickname for supervisory special agents, used by lower-ranked employees. Hmm. You're not a rat, are you? I asked rhetorically. Bruce's eyes flicked between the two of us. What's going on, James? Who is he? She asked frantically. I looked at her vacantly before turning slowly to Dennis Gordon. He's FBI, I revealed. Ruth looked at the pair of us, shell-shocked. Dennis Gordon simply smirked. Special Agent Scott Hamer, FBI. Division of Special Operations he said, introducing his real identity. And I've been working on getting recruited for the last 27 months. And finally, I was on the inside of this group, climbing the ranks for the past three months. Well, I was until you got kidnapped and got me arrested, he said, crossing his arms in a mild song. Well, believe it or not, it wasn't something I'd signed up for. If you're FBI, then why are you still sat here? Surely they could extract you, Ruth asked, and I simply shook my head. Ancient Harmer, though, answered her question. My brief was to embed myself into an organized crime syndicate operating in Kansas City, which I accomplished. The second stage was to climb the ranks of the organization and find out the identity of the top man or woman. Given now the group of people on the inside of the prison, my objective is still achievable from in here. Well, it'll be a lot harder, but still doable. Yeah, they won't extract him until either his cover's compromised or the mission's complete. Special operations are the real deal, I informed Ruth. Did you know who I was when I came to the nightclub? Ruth asked curiously. Well, Hamer chuckled. Yeah, I've been briefed on all members of Operation Appletree, he replied, smirking at Ruth. And she rolled her eyes and sat back in her chair, arms folded. <sighs> That was me thinking I was some sort of badass CIA agent, she stated, disappointedly. Ah, I wouldn't threat too much about it. Don't think there's a heterosexual male walking this earth that wouldn't give you their number, darling. Well, let's hope next time the target's not an undercover agent, eh? Ruth smirked and exhaled through her nose in amusement. So, when I called during the assault on Special Agent Rodriguez, you knew it was me? Yes, but... The fact I answered that call has knocked our investigation back weeks, probably even months. But when I saw you were calling, it didn't take a genius to know what you were doing. And if you didn't get there soon, they would have killed him. Well, when you put it like that, I owe you my life, Special Agent. I'd shake your hand, but I can barely move it, I joked. And Agent Hamer chuckled. <sighs> Don't worry about it, Soup, he said with a wink. But, well doesn't explain why you asked to speak to me, so come on, I pressed. The reason the FBI deployed me and the reason I didn't want to speak to anyone from Operation Appletree is because we have strong reasons to believe that the OCG have people inside the Bureau. And within months of my undercover work, that was confirmed when he and Malik was murdered. Someone in the FBI tipped us off that he was talking. <laughs> You're kidding, Ruth exclaimed. However, I wasn't too shocked, and it showed. Ah, you suspect it too, he said with realization. Ruth turned to me, eyeing me curiously. Yeah, but Detective Marshall was arrested and a search team found a cache of burner phones in his room, linking him to multiple information leaks throughout Operation Appletree, including the information on Ian Malik. But well, he's not Bureau, he's Sandino PD but the evidence suggests he's been working for the OCG all this time and prior to Appletree, Ruth pointed out. Hamer then turned to address her. Yeah, I know the guy. Died in the gym a few days ago, Hamer informed us. Well, they're saying suicide because he was VP in training alone, I told him. Oh, look, the group have people in this prison on both sides of the bars. I think it'll be interesting to read the pathologist's report. Hamer scoffed. So, you don't think he was the group's inside man? 
I asked, seeing if he thought the same as me. He seemed to mull it over for a few seconds before shrugging. Well, unfortunately, I can't confirm if he was the source of all that information, but he came to the nightclub a day or two after the ambush. He asked to look at the CCTV of the night that Sandy Marsh was arrested for assault. He was in there, looking through the footage for around an hour, and then he left. I knew he was corrupt from that moment. Because, well, I'm guessing you wanted that footage to get a visual on the nominal known as Pablo. Am I right? Hamer speculated. You know who he is? I asked with urgency. No. But he was on that footage. Look, I work for a guy called Frank. Real name Phil Marsh. He's the group's shock caller. When it comes to their narcotics trade, that is. Heroin comes in from Chicago. Cocaine from Texas. Meth from Detroit. All of it brought through the trucking depots. They run it through various means. The towers and the blocks mainly. But we also run the cocaine through the nightclubs. The aura is just one of many. The group used salons, takeouts, strip clubs, and construction sites as money laundering fronts. Right now I'm not involved with the, uh, parties. He informed us with an uncomfortable tone to his voice. You mean the grooming parties? where young and vulnerable girls are lured in, manipulated and exploited for sex, and then murdered for their silence? Those parties? Ruth asked with a tone in her voice. Look, the nominal known as Pablo is in charge of the livestock, as they call it. I'm not close to him right now. Well, the plan was to be, because Nathan, Mark, Frank, well, they all hold incredible clout in the group, but, well, Pablo... He's a level above the rest, he told us intensely. If you knew he was on the CCTV, why didn't you send the images to your covert operations manager? We could have had an ID on him by now, I questioned. Well, because that isn't my mission. My mission is to integrate myself as deep as possible, no matter what. Just climb the ranks and find out organically who the top man is, he told me unequivocally. Why didn't the nightclub just delete the CCTV if they're owned by the OCG? I questioned further. Ah, oh, the nightclub isn't owned by the OCG. They front as a security firm who act as muscle for our dealers, so they can move the gear effectively. The nightclub owner hasn't a clue what goes on, he informed us. I pulled a satisfied expression at his explanation, while Ruth seemed to be mulling something over whilst we spoke. Oh, do you think he's the top man? Pablo, I mean, would explain why he's got more sway than the others, Ruth suggested. No, there's someone above them all, pulling the strings. But Pablo and this guy are close. Why, we don't know, but he's the key to the ringleader, I know it. Pablo, hmm, maybe he's the FBI mole. That would make anyone an asset to the leader of a multifaceted criminal organization. Yeah, maybe, but... If it helps you guys, well, when I saw the footage, as far as I could tell, he didn't match anyone on the members of the task force that I'd been briefed on. And I can't imagine the mole wouldn't make sure he gets on the task force investigating the group he's a part of. So, well, I don't know. But there's something about Pablo. Something the OCG don't want public. We never told his name. Does all his contacting by burner. To be honest, that's why all the girls that he recruits for grooming are all murdered mainly to protect the sickos they're groomed for, but also to protect Pablo's identity. Look, I'll see what I can find out in here. You see what you can find out out there. Find this guy, because he must know who the top man is. If we get the top man, then he'll give up all the corrupt officials helping him. Just as Hamer finished, a loud knocking banged on the door. Gordon, time's up, a guard yelled. I looked up and saw the red light come back onto the camera. So, remember if the feds or the police ask you anything, you say no comment, I said, keeping up this pretense. Ah, well do, he said deliberately. We all shook hands before myself and Ruth left the prison. Chapter 18 Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the briefing, and, more importantly... Welcome back to Supervisory Special Agent Rodriguez. Martinez's opening was met with applause from the others. 
I looked around the room and spotted a new face. Soup, this is Special Agent Falden, also from the Serious and Organized Crime Division. He's worked alongside me under Supervisory Special Agent Michaels for a year or so now. He's Marshall's replacement. Well, we were looking at getting another agent in, but given how you're now back, part-time, and Michael's release should be processed in the next five working days, we should have him back too. Well, to take the reins, pending the outcome of his uh, psychological evaluation. I acknowledged him with a friendly nod. Pleased to meet you, S.A. Folder. Same to you, S.S.A. Rodriguez. You're somewhat of a legend in the hallways of the Bureau. It's an honor to be working a case with you. I'm also glad to see you're okay. Well, alive anyway, he said genuinely. I smiled at his shy awkwardness. Oh, it's fine, but if this all goes well, we could be working together more often. Before I lost myself over Quincy's death, I was running another task force, running surveillance on a growing trafficking group who were linked to the swarm. The idea was if we got enough evidence for a RICO warrant, then I'd make a permanent transfer from Behavioral Science Unit and lead up serious crime. So you, me, Michaels, and Martinez, we can make a good team, I told him enthusiastically. That sounds brilliant, Sue, Martinez added. Sure does, Folden agreed. Okay, this briefing is to catch up S.S.A. Rodriguez and S.A. Folden on the recent developments and targets of our investigation, Martinez said, now addressing the entire room. Well, Detective Ryan and Officer Patrick, we were originally told that the wiretap warrants and the surveillance had to be pulled due to the DOJ believing it was a waste of resources. However, when I took over from the soup, I found out that the surveillance operation was told to report solely to the task force commander, and in fact the wiretaps had actually gone live. Given how it was revealed Marshall was an OCG mole, the soup was spot on to make this call. It wasn't personal against anyone. He just needed to make sure the investigation wasn't compromised, given how the warrants were only authorized for 14 days. Now, unfortunately, we've been reviewing the recordings and the officers haven't said anything that implicate them in any criminal activities. The wiretaps are now ended and the DOJ have advised us not to focus on them any longer until we have further cause. The recordings are available for anyone to review at any point upon request. Martinez informed us with disappointment. Um, I'll have a copy of those tapes, please, I requested. Sure thing, Soup. I'll fire them over to your email. I thanked him with a nod and allowed him to continue. Well, this brings us to Police Captain Mike Xavier. We've been reviewing his employment history and who he associates with outside and inside the walls of the Kansas City Police Department. We don't just believe this is another corrupt official working under the command of the OCG leader, Mr. X, that is. Uh, we believe this is the man himself, Martinez began, raising the familiar Bluetooth remote and beginning the slideshow. A title appeared on the screen which read, Mr. X Profile. As Martinez spoke, he continued to press the button revealing the next bullet point as he read them out. Okay, compiled from various witness statements and the level of his power and reach, this is the most accurate composite profile of the OCG commanding nominal codenamed Mr. X. He then pressed the clicker. 1. Mr. X is male. All known suspects, agents, and assets who have come into contact with the individual have reported him to have a male frame, demeanor, and facial features. He said, with another click of the remote. 2. Given his ability to corrupt and intimidate officers of detective and uniform rank, as well as mislead high-level investigations, he surely ranked lieutenant or above. Another click of the remote revealed the next bullet point. 3. Given Mr. X's ever-growing network of corrupt officials and violent criminals from the Kansas City area, as well as surrounding population centers on both sides of the river, he likely also lives within a hundred-mile radius of the city. Another click. 4. Given his power and influence was built on the sexual exploitation of vulnerable children and young women, as well as the trade of illegal drugs and guns, plus his ability to keep those ventures away from investigation, he likely has huge influence over detectives investigating vice crimes. 5. Given how Mr. X's criminal network is the sole criminal enterprise controlling the drugs, guns, human trafficking, and child exploitation in the city, 
He's likely used his position to focus police efforts on rival gangs to expand his network, whilst at the same time keeping it out of the authorities' limelight. 6. Given how the acts of 2, 4, and 5 have occurred over the past 8 years, Mr. X would have needed to have been in at least the position of detective since 2011. And finally, 7. Given how Thomas Danmore, aka the Roadside Slayer, gave an official statement about the abuse he suffered at Lawrence, on record, and was abducted and murdered by men, posing as his prison transport, within an hour of the recording being stopped. This suggests the person who ordered that hit not only had access to the tape, but was in the building at the time, had incredible influence and reach, and knew the details of the prison transport, such as its route and vehicle model. The tape was also destroyed and the recording was lost, yet no investigation was launched into why, being labelled as a technical fault. This suggests Mr. X is inside the Kansas City Police Department. Martinez allowed us all to take notes, while clicking the remote and the list of bullet points moved from the centre of the screen, now taking up a position on the left side, leaving space on the right for another set of bullet points. Now, let's look at Mike Xavier. Martinez instructed, clicking the remote. 1. Mike Xavier, male, 50 years of age. 2. Xavier has worked for the Kansas City Police Force for nearly 30 years, promoted from lead detective to lieutenant, overseeing vice back in 2004, running the squad for 8 years before being promoted to station captain in 2012. 3. Xavier's home address is 1535 North Canwood Circle, Lee Summit, Missouri well inside the 100 mile radius, and he's lived at this address since his promotion in 2012. Prior to this, he lived at 101 Jansen Place, Central Hyde Park, Kansas City, Missouri. This address is a stone's throw away from the Union Hill area, where Ian Malik reported visiting a known grooming party back in 2011, operated by the elusive figure Pablo, who's seemingly the right-hand man of Mr. X. 4. As stated in point 2, Mike Xavier has been a part of Vice for over 20 years. Whether it was uniform, sergeant, detective, or lieutenant, he's been involved in countless operations. Significantly, he made a press statement in 2012 after his promotion that read, I am thankful for the consideration and grateful for the chiefs and the commissioner for selecting me for this promotion. I will personally be focusing the efforts of the Vice Squad in clamping down on the numerous criminal gangs polluting our city with drugs and weapons and forcing women into prostitution. I along with the support of the officers below me and the executives above me, vow to clean up this city. Our numerous drug gangs, gun suppliers, and pimps have also been arrested during Xavier's reign as police captain. Yet the Lawrence home for boys, Pablo's grooming parties, the cocaine, the heroin, the meth, the illegal weapons been imported from Ireland. It's all still happening, despite all these arrests. 5. Captain Xavier was present the day that Dan Moore and Hansen were abducted by the OCG. They had information on him, and guess who signed the report that wrote the tape being deleted was a technical fault. Martinez clicked the remote one final time, revealing a document about a disciplinary hearing of a girl called Rachel Madden for destroying the police property with grave evidential loss. Rachel had pleaded a case saying the tape was never listened to or handed off to a third party, was kept in a locked cabinet in the evidence storeroom, with the keys handed back to her commanding officer. With there being nothing but circumstantial evidence against her, she was cleared of all criminal suspicion, and the disciplinary board judged the tape must have been damaged due to being mishandled by her during extraction and storage. She was given a written warning and led off with a caution. This decision was given by the head of the discipline board, Captain Mike Xavier. Uh, it's clear to me that Mike Xavier fits the profile of the main villain of this criminal organization. His background and activities fit the timeline of the syndicate taking over the city, as well as other significant misleads of high-profile investigations that could uncover this clandestine network of violent criminals. Uh, it appears that Michael Xavier should be our main and only target. If we bring him in, he could be the key to it all. Yeah, he would turn on every person who's ever assisted him or benefited from his activities well, to reduce his time inside, Martinez suggested. He waited my opinion while I mulled it over. Well, um, I think you're right. If this is our man, then 
This is how we crack this case in the time we have left. Marshall has likely already tipped off the OCG on what we know. No one's going to make any stupid moves that involve the parties, the country club, or Lawrence. The task force ends in less than three weeks. If we don't have what we need, the DOJ won't issue the RICO warrants. But I think you are right. I've seen it before, a large crime boss giving up everyone underneath him to save his own skin. Can't see why this one will be any different. Well done, I said, addressing the rest of the group as well as Martinez. Martinez looked really pleased with himself and winked at Sarah, who had clearly done a lot of the legwork in this presentation. However, I said, interrupting Martinez's proud moment. Everyone turned to face me then. This isn't enough. If we bring him in now, he'll have a lawyer who will advise him to say nothing, and we won't have a thing on him. A profile on what could be passed off as a series of coincidences doesn't pass as evidence. No, we need something concrete, something to back him into a corner. Martinez looked around the room. I could tell he felt somewhat embarrassed and undermined, judging by his expression, but ultimately he could see I had a point. Ah, uh, you're right, Soup. Well, uh, that's the focus of our investigation now. Find some evidential leverage on Mike Xavier, Martinez ordered. And the meeting ended there. Okay, Sarah, start going through Xavier's financials. Folden starts sifting through all the previous cases Xavier handled during his tenure as captain, in which he wrote the death of a prostitute or sex worker off as a suicide. Look at cases from the Union Hill or Overland Park area, because I think that's what Mr. X was doing when he ordered Kim to be murdered along with Sandy Marsh. Not only did he get rid of someone who was assisting us, but Kim was also a known sex worker, and this, coupled with a drug overdose, cause of death meant the Vice Squad had control of the investigation. While with Hanson gone, it appears the OCG don't have an asset in homicide. There may be something we can pull apart. We need that post-mortem back on those bodies, I asserted. Well, Martinez once again looked a little pissed. I was commanding everyone, despite him being acting task force commander. Yeah, um, well, like I've already informed the team in your absence, an independent medical examiner has been assigned, he said, a clear edge to his tone. There was an atmosphere in the room now. Well, seems you've got everything in hand. I've got a physio appointment this afternoon, so me and Ruth are going to be absent until tomorrow, I said, breaking the ice. And suddenly, Martinez seemed ultra-aware of how he'd been. Oh, yeah, of course. Your health comes first, Soup. You go. We've got things covered for now. When we've got something to leverage Xavier, we'll call you in. Oh, it's been great to see you up and about, sir. Here, here. Sarah exclaimed with a smile. We all exchanged goodbyes, and Ruth and I made our way down to the garage. Just before I wheeled down to the elevator, Ruth seemed to forget something, and she turned to me with a thoughtful look on her face. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go speak to Sarah about something. Something we were working on last week. I won't be long, she assured me, jogging back down towards the meeting room. I made my own way down and waited no more than a couple of minutes for Ruth before she caught up with me at the car. Once we were both inside, Ruth began typing in the zip code for the hospital in the GPS. I reached out and stopped her, tapping the screen with her finger. Hey, I uh, don't have a physio appointment, I confessed. And she eyed me with a curious smirk. So then, where are we going? She inquired. I scoffed gently, grinned, and nodded forward. The airport. Chapter 19 As the plane landed in Ontario International Airport, I began bringing the car hire details up on my phone, ready for when we got into the arrivals lounge. Fair play to Enterprise, they had us a lovely black Dodge Charger to cruise around Southern California in for the next 24 hours. We climbed in the car and put Bullard and Powell Law Firm into the GPS and set off to speak to Mr. Roger Barnard. So... You reckon this guy will have some helpful information? Ruth inquired. I met her gaze as she spoke, but then stared into space as I thought over her question. Hmm. I think it's something we need to cover. Marshall was in prison, clearly in a vulnerable position, given his death. Why wait for a lawyer over 1,500 miles away? I understand you have a lawyer, but when it came out that he was held up in court, 
He could have hired representation from anywhere. No, oh, well, call it a hunch, but I think Marshall confided in the lawyer before he came to Apple Tree, in case something like this happened. Now he's dead, and the attorney-client privilege isn't as much of a barrier. Ruth seemed impressed by my idea. Well then, let's see what he's got to say for himself. Bullard and Powell Criminal Law was a fancy-looking building, three stories of huge open windows and silver-colored brick lining the ceilings and walls, the tropical-style garden by the entrance keeping the building in touch with the city's aesthetic. We entered the main building and approached the front desk. A woman in her mid-thirties with a Latino heritage sat frantically manning the desk, sporting glasses and a headset. We stood there for a good ten minutes. Well, Ruth stood. I sat, just about peering over the desk. After the last call ended and no others came through, the woman sighed heavily and took a moment to herself, holding her forehead in her hand. I'm busy, Ruth asked facetiously. The woman looked up at her, chuckling and raising an eyebrow in a sassy fashion. We're a criminal law firm in Southern California, honey. What do you think? She asked with playful sarcasm. Ruth simply chuckled. <laughs> Fair point. So, um, how may I help you, miss? She asked, now reverting back to her professional tone. I cleared my throat, loudly and deliberately, to let her know there were two of us. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. My apologies. How may I help you both? She corrected herself. Um, we're hoping to see Roger Bernard, I asked. The woman pouted and tilted her head to the side. I shall see if he's available, she said, punching numbers on the phone set. She then sat back and allowed the call to connect. A few seconds later, she perked up as the call was answered. Ah, oh, Mr. Bernard, it's Selena from the desk. Yeah, so, um, I've got... She shot us a look, silently asking for our names. Oh, um, Supervisory Special Agent Rodriguez, I informed her. And Professor Maddock, Ruth added. Oh, yeah, and Agent Rodriguez from the FBI and uh, Professor Maddock. Can I send them up? Uh, okay, okay, I'll tell him. She put the phone down and met our gaze. I'm sorry, he's in meetings all day, but he said you can leave a contact number and he'll give you a call when he's available, she informed us. Well, Ruth and I looked at each other and simply shrugged. What else could we do? Sure, Ruth said, writing down her cell number and sliding it to Selena. We're in town till tomorrow morning. Our flight leaves at 11. She assured us she'd get him to contact us before we left. We thanked her for a time, and then we left the building. Dinner, I suggested, now that we had a lot of spare time on our hands. Ruth gave me the same seductive grin she did when I could walk. She knew how to make me feel like a man, that's for sure. We went and arranged some accommodation for the night, before going to find somewhere to get some food. We were sat in a lovely little Mediterranean restaurant, enjoying a mixed grill each when Ruth's phone rang. She looked down at the number. Seeing it was a San Bernardino number, she answered it. Ruth Maddock, she said, allowing the person to identify themselves. I heard them speak, which caused Ruth to stare at me. She handed the phone over to me. He wants to talk to you. I received the handset from her and put it to my ear. Rodriguez. Hello, SSA Rodriguez. It's Roger Barnard here. Selena said you guys wanted to speak to me. I'm assuming this is about Detective Marshall? The voice asked. It is, I answered cautiously. Ah, I thought so. That's why I didn't want to see you. I needed some time to do some due diligence, he explained. Due diligence? I questioned. Yeah, um, well, uh, it's probably best we meet in person, he suggested. Okay, fine. We're in the Mediterranean island, Cuba. Oh, no, no, nowhere public. You got a motel room? He requested. Well, I was a little cautious about this, given that Marshall was in bed with the OCG. Oh, the last time we asked to speak to a detective who wanted time to himself, he put a tracker on my car and Ruth was nearly abducted, not to mention my recent so-called meet-up. But this time, I had a plan. Yeah, roadway in room six, one hour, I told him. Well, that works. Right, see you then, he said, before hanging up the call. I handed the phone back to Ruth, who was looking at me, puzzled. What's wrong? 
Why did you tell him the wrong hotel? She inquired. Well, I chuckled. <laughs> Just making sure we don't both get abducted again, I said with a wink. We waited in the car, outside the roadway inn. We'd bribed the front desk worker $50 to give the true motel address to anyone who proved they were Roger Barnard. Only passport or driver's license would do, and he had to be alone. We were expecting him to arrive around 10pm, and at 10.04pm a red Audi pulled into the parking lot. The personalized reg was R08B4RD. Yeah, this had to be him. A man who matched the picture from Bullard and Powell's website exited the vehicle and made his way inside. We fired up the engine, and quickly Ruth jumped out of the car and made her way, nonchalantly, over to the red Audi, mainly to check it was empty. She quickly circled back and jumped back in the driver's seat. All clear, she confirmed. Around five minutes later, Roger Bernard exited the motel, looking a little frustrated. He climbed into his car, pulled out the parking lot and began travelling towards the Econo Lodge Hotel, with us in close pursuit. Around eight minutes later, both cars pulled into the parking lot of our actual hotel. As he climbed out of his vehicle, we watched him pull out his cell phone. He dialed a number. We were relieved when Ruth's phone began to chime. I answered it. Am I where I need to be? Or have I got any more hoops to jump through? He asked with annoyed sarcasm. Oh, we had due diligence of our own to do, that's all. I assured him. Okay, so where are you? He asked. Make your way up to room 13. We'll see you there. I instructed, hanging up the phone. Barnard entered the building... We waited. No van, no SUV, no men in balaclavas followed him in. So we exited the car and made our way into the building. When the elevator doors opened, we saw Bernard waiting by our door at the end of the hallway. He looked at us with annoyed amusement. You guys are paranoid, you know that? Oh, we've just had a few bad experiences with trusting people who want to meet us, that's all. I informed him. He took one look at me in my chair and nodded with acceptance. Yeah, I know. Well, should we go inside? I nodded, put the key card in the door, and we made our way inside. Bernard sat down in the chair and began pulling a laptop out of his bag, placing it on the table. He then pulled out a flash drive, whilst I rolled up my chair next to him, and Ruth took a seat on the edge of the bed. As he set up whatever it was he was going to show us, he began to explain his earlier actions. Well, I wasn't in a meeting earlier, but when Selena said people from the FBI were here, I needed to make sure you weren't them, he said ominously. Them? Ruth asked. Yeah, you'll see what I mean. I did some digging on you. I so saw you were the agent that Marshall was accused of conspiracy to kidnap. So, um, it was then I realized you were clean. Clean? I asked. You watch, he said, pressing play on the keyboard. A still shot of Detective Marshall was on the screen. When he pressed the space bar, the video began to play. Detective Marshall began to speak. I'm making this video should anything happen to me during Operation Apple Tree. Whatever I did or was accused of doing wasn't because I was dirty or corrupt. It was because I love my family. Operation Apple Tree was set up in order to establish links between corrupt Missouri and Kansas public officials and a ruthless clandestine crime syndicate, operating mainly in the Kansas City area. My sister, Charlene, she lives in Topeka. I don't know how they found this out, but around two weeks before Operation Apple Tree was due to launch, I received an offer from the FBI's organized crime team, requesting me to take part in the operation due to my wealth of experience in organized crime. I accepted, of course, but literally two days later, I received a USB pen and a burner phone. The files on the USB were deleted by some sort of malware once I'd viewed all the contents, but the flash drive contained videos of my sister and my two nieces. The first two were my sister washing the dishes, the cameraman outside. The second was my two nieces walking home from school with the camera being held out of a car window. Well, the third video, though, was my sister and my nieces in bed asleep. The cameraman was inside the house. 
The fourth and final video was a man wearing a balaclava to cover his face. He told me that the task force was aiming to destroy everything he'd built over the past decade. And if I wanted to keep my sister alive and my niece is pure, then well, I had to do whatever they tell me to do. My sister's the only family I have left. I had to do what they asked me. The video ended there. Bernard beginning to load another video. He recorded that two days before he left for KC. He also gave me this. It's the burner phone. Well, they told him to get rid of it and he'd receive a new one once he got to KC. He then pulled the phone from his briefcase and opened the texts. The unknown number texts him the day after the package arrives, asking him to pick up a package the day he left for KC and to drop it at a designated location once arriving in Missouri. He texts the number back saying, I'm going to be with the FBI. I can't have drugs on me. Then the number texts him back saying, don't worry about that. How do you think you got on the task force? Just do it. Right, now, watch this. He began playing the next video. Marshall, this time, sat next to a large black holdall. So, I've just picked this up from San Diego. He unzipped the bag and showed the camera its contents. Ten large white bricks in cellophane wrapping could be seen. It's ten kilos of uncut cocaine. I've been instructed to take this to KC. Unfortunately, now I can't fly, so I'll have to drive it to KC. I don't know what else they'll make me do over there. But even just this makes me sick. Well, I'm documenting all of this for the purpose of potential evidence. Should I be imprisoned or even worse, murdered? I want someone to know what happened. The video ended there. I delivered the package as these people demanded. He arrived in KC and took the bag to a house in the Parkview area. That was the last I heard from him, so he sent me an email a few weeks back whilst he was on the run. These were the three videos in the email. He then pressed play. So, this morning I dropped a bag off with a guy named Frank, who handed me another burner in return. I headed straight to the task force HQ from here. Thankfully, no one questioned me why I was so late, despite my FBI paid flight having landed a day previous. I haven't heard anything else from these people, so hopefully they'll leave me and my family alone now. During the video, Marshall held up the burner phone to evidence what he was saying was true. Thinking back to that first day, it explained now why Marshall was late. The next video played. Yeah, I thought they'd left me alone, finally, but... Yesterday, I was tasked with retrieving a piece of CCTV footage from a nightclub called The Aura. Apparently, a girl named Sandy Marsh, who's a current missing person, assaulted a person known to our inquiry as Pablo, a potential recruiter for the OCG's grooming and trafficking operation. Last night, not only was one of our potential witnesses murdered in a violent ambush, but I received a text on my burner, instructing me to go to the nightclub and get the staff to delete the footage, which I did. But I also made myself a copy for the purpose of these videos. I honestly thought there'd be more to come from these people. However, today, one of the members of the task force, a member of the FBI's organized crime task department, SSA Michaels, was arrested for organizing the hit on the witness. Oh, this is surely the guy who's been blackmailing me and pulling the strings. Oh, hopefully, this all stops now. But if he tries to turn me in for less time... Well, these videos may help my case. The next and final video played. I don't have long. Since the nightclub, I haven't been asked to do anything further, but yet, today, I received a text on the burner advising me that the FBI were onto me. They knew I was the mole, and they knew I arranged the hit on Ian Malik. Kim, and also what was about to happen to James. Yeah, he was here. I realized two things. That SSA Michaels was innocent. He wasn't the FBI mole. But more worryingly, that I was being fitted up for everything that was going wrong. When Ruth told me she knew what I'd done, I knew I had to run. I needed this time to get all this together. They sent me that text because they wanted me to be caught with this burner, and also the text making it look like I got a tip-off from the top man, Mr. X. Oh, I know I should get rid, but I need to corroborate these entries. 
had nothing to do with the deaths of Malik, Sandy Marsh Kim, or James Rodriguez. I need to get back to San Bernardino and seek the legal defense of Roger Barnard, who knows my situation. Hopefully, I make it because well, they'll silence me if they get me inside. The video ended there. And we all sat back and took the information in. Roger Bernard looked at us somberly. He was a good man. He didn't deserve how his life ended. I sighed heavily. Thank you for showing us this. No problem. Least I could do. You make sure you catch the bastard who's doing this, won't you? He requested. We will, Ruth assured him, as Bernard typed away on his computer. I'm sending a copy of the CCTV that Marshall shot on his phone. Hope it helps, he said, punching in my email address that I'd given him. Once sent, he packed up his things and left the room. When he left, Ruth and I opened up the video file on my phone and watched it. The video was a little grainy due to it being a video taken in haste, of another video that is. However, after many, many failed attempts to try to pause the video on the brief moment we get a clear look at Pablo's face, we finally managed to get one. He matched the description we had from Mary White. We screenshotted the image, and I sent it to a personal friend of mine in the CIA. When you bring down the world's most notorious criminal gang, you make a few powerful friends of your own. I requested he get us a name and current whereabouts of this man, based on facial recognition software and CCTV cameras. He emailed me back shortly, saying he'd get right on it. I replied saying I'd owe him ten if he got me a hit. Our work was done in SoCal. So we got our heads down for the night and left for the airport the next morning. Chapter 20 As the plane started its descent and the sight of the slithering Kansas River began protruding through the clouds, Ruth turned to me and had a serious look on her face. So when we walk back into that room, how do we play this? She asked. I stared into space, chewing the skin off my lip trying to come up with a plan. Well, I think we sit on this for a while, at least until we get an ID on Pablo. If we tell the rest, we can't guarantee this won't reach Mr. X, and they can make arrangements. But before we go there, I think we should take another trip to Leavenworth, I suggested. You want to talk to Hamer again? She asked. Yeah, let's see what he has to say about what we've learned from Bernard. I'll call the prison when we land. Make an appointment, Ruth said. Oh, I'll make two. Well, I think it's about time I went to see Michaels, too. The plane landed. We claimed our baggage and made our way to Ruth's car. We arrived at Leavenworth 25 minutes later. We entered the prison. Our visiting slot with our client was booked for 11.45 a.m. It was 11.35 when we entered the building. We signed in once again with Mrs. Personality of the Year and took our seats in the waiting room. 11.45 came, and it went. Delays were commonplace when visits took place outside of normal visiting hours. However, when 12.15 came and still nothing, we began to get a bit concerned. I approached the desk and asked what was the hold-up. Her blank, I had enough of this minimum wage job face, let out a tired sigh. She pulled the radio from her desk drawer and held it up to her mouth. It's Mandy from desk. Any update on Dennis Gordon? His legal team are on my back. She asked her colleague, whilst looking me dead in the eye, flashing me a sarcastic grin as she spoke about me as if I wasn't there. However, for the first time, her face dropped. Just for a split second, but I definitely noticed her attitude turn to shock and her eyes widen a fraction. Something had disturbed her. Uh, okay, I'll tell him, she stated, before replacing the radio and turning back to address me. Uh, he isn't coming, there's some... been an incident. An incident? I snapped. Suddenly she began to appear reluctant to mumble. I mean, uh, accident. There's been an accident, she corrected. What sort of accident? I probed. Oh, he slipped in the kitchen on his work duty. He's on his way to St. John Hospital, she said. 
and I could tell there was something she was holding back. But I could also tell she wasn't going to tell us either. Fine, we'll check in on him after we leave. What about our other client, Gerald Michaels? Uh, we wanted to see him too, Ruth chirped in. The Fed boy. Oh, you guys sure do have an expansive client base. I'll give you that much, she said with the most enthusiasm I'd ever seen her exert. She got on the radio and requested someone to fetch him from his cell. Fifteen minutes passed, and we were called through. The guard led us to a steel door and began to get his card pass that hung from his lanyard. Fifteen minutes, he told us. We nodded as he swiped us in. Michaels was already sat in the chair on the other side of the glass. He looked anxious, panicked, and very vulnerable. He was pale, shaken, and looked like he'd been crying. He looked unharmed, though, at least physically anyway. My God, James, Michaels gasped, watching me roll up to the desk. Oh, I heard what happened from Martinez, he said. Hey, Jerry, how you doing? I asked tentatively. Oh, I've been better, James, he said with weak sarcasm. So, um, why'd you want to see me? Some information has come to our attention that strongly suggests you were framed for the Ian Malik hit. Yeah, I know. Detective Marshall the Snake. Sitting next to us at that table like he was our friend. Yet he did it and framed me. He did this to me. He worked for the criminals all along. Damn, no wonder he killed himself. It's hell in here for law enforcement. Whether you're corrupt or not doesn't matter. Well, at least they found what they needed, though. Quantico say the DOJ should have my release processed in the next seven days. Oh, I need to get out of here, guys, he said shakily. Well, um, actually, there's a chance that he didn't kill himself. The evidence we've uncovered hasn't yet been passed to the DOJ. But it looks like Marshall, while well, yes, working for the OCG, well, it looks in fact like he was blackmailed to do a couple of small tasks, but also to be set up as their fall guy as an insurance policy. It was made to look like he framed you, conspired to murder Ian Malik, amongst some of the other complications with our investigation, such as me. I informed him this, showing off my newfound wheels. Michaels looked absolutely horrified by this information. What? Oh my god, I'm never getting out of here, he yelled, beginning to break down. Hey, 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 come on, what's the problem? I asked frantically. Those phones they found in Marshall's apartment... They proved I had nothing to do with it. Now you're saying they could have been planted? Don't you see? The DOJ are going to back out until they find out who planted them. Oh, no, I can't take it anymore in here. He slammed his head on the table and began sobbing. Look, Detective Marshall states in a video he doesn't think you ratted on Malik. He was blackmailed by someone in the FBI, potentially someone on the task force and he documented all the texts and burners he received, none of which were the ones found in his apartment. Evidence was planted in his apartment, just like it was in yours. But I think in time, it'll help your case, especially the other evidence that's on there. It can lead to other arrests, which should prove your innocence with their testimony, I explained. He snapped his head up, cheeks red, eyes inflamed, tears streaming. Oh, I can't take that chance, James, he yelled, it took me and Ruth back a little, just how broken he actually was. Jerry, what's been happening? I asked with grave concern. He pulled himself together long enough to tell me. Oh, they piss in my water, shit in my food. Notes under my door saying they're going to cave my face in when they get a chance. If they can't get to me, they'll slit my kids' throats, reminding me that I can't do anything to protect them while I'm in here. I don't know how they're doing it. The guards must be in on it too. James, you know me. I put a lot of violent criminals away when I was part of the KC Mafia Rico investigation. They all know I'm in here. It's only a matter of time before they get to me. And that's if the new OCG don't see me as a loose end that needs tying up first. And if you hand that evidence over, that chance is more likely to happen. Please, don't. Just don't hand it over, he pleaded. Look, Jerry, I came here mainly to apologize to you. 
I should have believed you when you said you were framed. The holes in the evidence were there, and I should have challenged it more. But what you're asking me from here, I can't do it. You're in prison, accused of being a corrupt federal agent, and you're asking me to bury evidence? Do you know how bad that sounds? I asked with a baffled smirk. Well, Michaels broke down again. I'm sorry, James, he sobbed. I'm just so desperate. I'm not asking you to bury it, just delay handing it over, at least until the DOJ have processed my release. Like you say, looks good on me, but in the long run, if you prove Marshall didn't frame me, they'll keep me in here. But if I'm out, they'll just keep me under house arrest at the worst until they investigate. At least I'll be with my family and safe. James, please. It's one week. You said you felt bad. Well, this is how you make it square. I mulled it over for a few seconds before finally making my peace with it. Okay. Deal. Fresh tears protruded from his eyes, but these were happy tears. Thank you, he said, with no volume due to his emotional state. We smiled as he calmed himself down. So, who's the arrest? You said there was some new evidence in what you had that could lead to a big arrest? He asked, coming across more as a change of subject, though. Probably sick of crying in front of us. This was brought up after you'd left the office after the Malik interview. A girl named Sandy Marsh went missing around two months ago. The last known sighting of her was a CCTV camera from the Aura nightclub from an assault charge. The charges were dropped due to lack of evidence after the copy of the footage was lost by the KCPD. The man that she assaulted matched that profile of Pablo, the OCG's lead man on grooming and trafficking. We finally got a copy of the tape and have a photo of Pablo. This guy is high up the chain by all accounts and there's reasons to believe he's FBI. I confessed to him. Michael's eyes widened and a hint of belief washed over his face. What? So, this would prove definitely I wasn't corrupt. Exactly. Uh, if anything, it's likely this man did or at least gave the order for Ian Malik's murder. The photo is grainy, though. I, I don't recognize him. Do you? I said, holding the photo to the screen. Michael stared at the image intently, like his freedom depended on it. Damn, the face does look a little familiar. But I can't honestly say I recognize him. And I've met a lot of agents. He confessed. Well, I've sent the image to a friend of mine in the CIA. He's going to get it analyzed and he's going to email me with a full ID and whereabouts. Hopefully I'll have something soon. If we can get him in a room, he could confess to framing you. And then you'll be totally in the clear. I assured him. Michaels took a deep breath. He looked panicked and on edge. Yeah, something wrong. Please, protect my family until I'm out. They're my world. If I get out and something's happened, I might as well just let them finish me in here, he said somberly. Jerry, I made you a promise, didn't I? We'll get you out of here, I assured him. I'm going to sit on Marshall's tapes until the DOJ process your release, and I'll put a unit outside your home address. In the meantime, we'll try and hunt down the man who can clear your name for good. So you stay strong, stay safe. There's been a lot of people who've wound up in here that have been hurt, ones that really didn't deserve it. Michaels began to fill up once again, an appreciative smile on his face. Thank you. Yeah, take care, I said with a wink and a grin. It's good to see him more positive. The guard then opened the door and escorted us out of the prison. Our next stop was St. John Hospital. We entered through the main door and told the nurse we were there to see Scott Hamer. She looked confused. Oh, I'm sorry, but there's no one of that name registered here, she informed us. It was then we both realized our error. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, you must have been taken somewhere else. Well, um, we're also here to see a Dennis Gordon. Is he in your care too? I asked, making sure not to reveal they were the same person. I didn't want to blow his cover until we knew what had happened. The receptionist typed away on a keyboard before looking at the doctor's notes. She read them to herself and her face went from polite grin to disturbed frown. Oh, I'm sorry, but your friend passed away shortly after arriving. 
His injuries were pretty severe. Well, if you want, I can request the doctor come speak with you, she offered, silently praying that we didn't react emotionally to the news. Oh, um, yeah, okay, please, uh, yeah, that would be good, I muttered. She smiled sympathetically, nodded and picked up the desk phone. What should I say is here? She asked me, covering the receiver with her hand. Supervisory Special Agent James Rodriguez, FBI. I told her, seriously, showing my credentials. Well, it quickly dawned on her that we weren't to be kept waiting long. And we weren't. A doctor came through the elevator doors five minutes later and waved us over. The lift doors closed behind us, and we began to ascend. Hi, I'm Dr. Benjamin. Nurse on the desk said you have some questions about Mr. Gordon, he asked, sanitizing his hands. Yeah, um, we were a little confused because we were told by the prison that he had a fall in the kitchen. I told the doctor, who once again got that same disturbed look on his face that the guard and the nurse both had shown. Uh, well, um, if he did, then he fell head first into the deep fat fryer, he informed us with a dark, humorous tone. The deep fryer? Ruth asked incredulously as the elevator pinged, indicating we'd reached the designated floor. Oh, come with me, he instructed, and we followed. Dr. Benjamin led us down a long corridor until we reached a glass window, looking into a private room. He gestured his head towards the glass, instructing us to take a look. We turned our heads ominously to see into the room. Dennis Gordon, well, we're assuming anyway, was lying motionless in a bed. A couple of nurses were busy unplugging the machines and removing the tubes and catheters. The skin around his neck and chest was dead, pale, and looked as if you could peel it off with your fingers. But his face, oh, his face repulsed me. The flesh had bubbled and crackled, splitting as the tendons sizzled up and pulled apart the blistered skin. His eyeballs had either burst in their sockets, or they'd simply crusted up and blended into what remained of his head. His lips and flesh around his nose had completely peeled away, leaving a sickening sight of protruding teeth, resembling a horse's smile, with a small white tip of his nasal bone poking through the blisters and crust. Jesus Christ, Ruth gasped, putting her hand over her mouth to stop her screaming. I stared at what was left of an agent who'd given up his actual life to help bring down this organization. Ruth began to cry. She took this harder than I'd expected her to. I'm sorry, I, I just I can't, she muttered as me and Dr. Benjamin both watched her as she ran away in a state and took refuge in the female bathroom. Uh, so, um, can you tell me what happened? I asked the doctor. He pursed his lips and cocked his head in thought. Uh, prison staff who came with the ambulance gave us a few details. So they found him in the kitchen after work duty. He was unresponsive. They even said his face was still in the fryer. Both his arms were broken too. This was no accident. He'd suffered a serious assault. He died from his injuries before we could treat him. We gave him some pain relief to try and make him comfortable, but no morphine in the world could have soothed what he was feeling. Even if he'd survived the injuries and managed to fight off the countless bouts of septic infections over the months, he wouldn't have been able to live a normal life. Oh, the best plastic surgeons in the world couldn't fix that, the doctor admitted with regret. Okay, look, don't be surprised if you get a call from the Special Operations Division of the FBI. They'll likely want to find out exactly what happened to this man, so you make sure you tell them everything you can remember about what the prison staff told you about his injuries. And, well, thanks for your time, doctor. Yeah, sure, no problem he said, going to shake my hand until realizing they were both heavily bandaged and probably not the best idea to squeeze and shake them. Instead, we exchanged a highly awkward nod and grin, and then we parted ways. I knocked on the bathroom door and called Ruth's name. She took a break from sniffling and sobbing long enough to yell back, I'll be out in a second. You okay? I asked, confused through the door. Yeah... I just need a sec. I'll meet you at the car, James, she pleaded back. I accepted her wishes and wheeled myself to the elevator. I sat by the car as I waited for Ruth to join me. 
and it was here that my phone pinged. I had an email from Clive Davis, my friend at the CIA. The subject was CCTV Mail ID. I opened it and read the file. Dear James, the individual in the photo has hit a match via our facial recognition software. Our software determines a 95.6% probability that the individual in the image is Andre Lopez, 29 years old, last known address 2929 McGee Street, 6D, Union Hill Luxury Apartments. Mother, Maya Lopez, father, Alexander Lopez, both deceased. Hope this information helps you with your investigation. Stay safe. Regards, Clive Davis, Case Analyst, CIA Headquarters, Langley. My eyes widened as I looked at this information. Finally, we had him. I looked up as I heard the sliding doors of the hospital open and Ruth was making her way over to me. When she got to me, she began to sputter out an explanation. Listen, James, I'm sorry. I just... I cut her off, shaking my head with a smile. No, oh, Ruth, it doesn't matter. The email just came through. We've not just got an ID on Pablo, or should I say Andre Lopez, but we've also got his address. Come on, let's nail this prick, I exclaimed, wheeling myself around to the passenger side door. Ruth quickly pulled herself together, jumped in the driver's side, and we tore out of the parking lot. As Ruth drove, I began replying to the email, requesting any more information that he could possibly dig up on his associates or relations, as it was highly possible that one of them could be Mr. X himself. I sent the email just as the Wi-Fi signal dipped, stalling its delivery. Before it had a chance to find some more 4G and fire it over, my battery died. Oh, I cursed myself for not bringing a cable with me, throwing the phone in a little hissy fit into the back seat. I instead asked to borrow Ruth's, to which she handed it over and I began to retype my email to Clive. However, mid-paragraph, Ruth turned to me. I found it strange that she hadn't acknowledged my childish anger moments ago, clearly too busy mulling something big over in her mind. She then began to confess something to me. The reason I was so upset about Gordon, or Hamer, I should say, is because I think I might be responsible, she confessed. I turned my head to face her, with a confused look on my face. I caught my head and squinted my eyes, gesturing for her to elaborate. Well, before we left for California, I went back. I warned Sarah that there could be a mole in the task force. Someone who was pulling Marshall's strings and who framed Michaels. Well, seeing that new guy, Falden, it just seemed convenient that Marshall's killed off. Michaels is logged up and suddenly a new FBI organized crime agent finds his way onto the team. Well, you told me once you said Mr. X would be able to manipulate the investigation. Now that you're gone, well, three of the team members being struck off and the Bureau send him. Something doesn't feel right. Oh, she's a good person. I wanted to keep her safe. She began to rant then, seemingly avoiding her point. So I pulled her up on it. But, um, what's that got to do with Scott Hamer? I asked, fearing I already knew the answer. Well, she asked me how, how I knew, and well, it's Sarah. I thought we could trust her. She began to babble, apologetic tears bursting through. Well, you know, maybe it was a rival gang. Maybe it had nothing to do with us. Maybe the OCG just wanted to tie up a loose end knowing he was arrested for the assault on a federal agent. I began to venture, hoping to comfort her. Come on, James. Either of those two scenarios, and it's a shiv in the dinner queue. No, oh, what happened to that man? Was, well, that's what happens to a rat who's tried to bring down a powerful criminal enterprise from the inside. Yeah, the day after I pass on to a member of our task force that's supposedly riddled with OCG corruption, and he's murdered right before we get a chance to talk to him again. Come on, we both know it, she said, cursing herself. And what she said began to make the gears in my head turn. Holy shit, maybe we've been looking at this wrong the whole time, I speculated. What do you mean? Ruth asked anxiously. 
maybe Mr. X isn't male, I suggested, a disturbed look on my face. But you've spoken to him, and so has Malik. You both said he was a man, she countered. Oh, he spoke to a man, yes, but Mr. X is a highly intelligent person, someone who manipulates everyone around them, goes completely under the radar to the point you wouldn't even consider them. We both know how he likes to pull people's strings and throw people off their scent. So what if the uh, man in the videos and the web chats is simply an actor, a prop, puppet? All this time we've been chasing a man when it could very well be a woman. Ruth's eyes widened incredulously. Holy shit. Frames Michaels gets him out of the way. Then she tries to have you killed. You're out injured, so then who moves up to task force leader? She prompted. Martinez, I answered, who just so happens to be the man who she is pursuing a relationship with, getting close to him, manipulating his decisions. Ruth placed a hand on her forehead. Oh shit, James. This is all of a sudden starting to make sense. Well, 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 what do you make of that? Things are definitely starting to um, come together now, aren't they? Well, don't worry, that isn't the end of it. There's quite a lot more to come. Probably another two hours. I'll try and get that all out to you next Sunday or well and good. But, of course, we'll see how things go. But yeah, I'm as eager as the rest of you. I haven't read this to the end yet. Um, I've just got um, the final part from the wonderful author, Mr. Luke Hemingway. So this is just as new to you as it is to me. Are you going to join me for the wonderful conclusion of this epic story? Of course you are. Well, thanks for joining me for so much of the story so far. And let's finish this together pretty soon. Well, my dear friends, till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.